my name is Dan Kegley. I am a past president for ILAC and uh, couldn't be more thankful to have Suzanne uh, step into that leadership role. She's been a godsend for uh, the, the collaborative. So uh, I just want to give her a quick round of applause. <laughs> Has been an honor. Well, and I so appreciate the opportunity. Today. I'm glad I don't have to follow her. I feel those shoes. This morning we have uh, John Porcello. He's with GSI Water Solutions. He came over from uh, Portland to give a little talk today on hydraulic modeling, a little bit of aquifer history. Um, John has been modeling. Close years, to 40 years. Close to 40 yeah. years now. Um, he does a lot of work locally with the city of Spokane, the Spokane Aquifer Joint Board, um, throughout the Portland, uh, well, throughout Washington, um, down through California. Uh, he'll, he's, I was just telling Amy, he's forgotten more about modeling than I probably will ever know. So um, I'm not going to take any more of his time because I know he's got a lot to cover. So, John. Thanks. Yeah, 40 years of modeling explains the gray hair, and, you know, all the mistakes you make along the way, which models can humble you. Well, it's a thrill to be here today. Thanks for coming both in person and online. Um, I always enjoy the opportunity to kind of lift the veil a little bit on this mystery world of what's happening in the subsurface with groundwater. How do we do water resource planning when we can't see what we're really looking at? And how do we use computer models to help us figure that out? Um, I'm gonna give you a very picture-based presentation today. It has a lot of slides. I don't expect you to see every detail on every slide. I just want you to get the big picture. And um, I'll probably take questions at the end, just because there's sort of a rhythm to the presentation. Um, but, uh, you know, take a few notes. I'm happy to talk with you afterwards as well. Um, we're going to cover about six topics here. First, I'll just start off with a little bit of the description of this regional aquifer system out here. And we'll talk a little bit about what a groundwater model is and what it does. Um, we'll talk about some of the history of groundwater modeling in this aquifer system it actually goes back to the late 1970s. Um, I'll then spend a fair amount of time on the topic regarding the most recent models that have been produced here. And recent goes back to the 1990s, but there was a lot of really critical work that was done particularly in the field that helped make models better in those days and really were kind of the springboard for where we're at today. And then I want to end by talking about, you know, it's great to build models, but what do you do with them? And why should we build them, invest in them? What kind of uses are they really good for? And I'll give you a few examples from some recent studies and planning efforts of how they're being used. Um, and today, um, Seth Oliver from DEQ will be talking about models as well. He'll talk a little more about the software and some of the different ways that the software drives decision-making about what you do with models. And then Amy will be building on that as well. Amy Summers from Spokane County and helping talk about kind of how important the data is that feeds into these models. Okay, before we get into those topics though, it's real important to acknowledge all the entities who already have done a great deal of work to help support what we already know today about the aquifer system and the quality of the models we have at hand. So of course, IWAC and Spokane Aquifer Joint Board, they're the two big multi-water purveyor entities that have been working on groundwater management issues in this aquifer. We have the local agencies, Spokane and Kootenai County in particular, and Panhandle Health District, who do much work in terms of data collection, groundwater quality protection, and those kinds of things. And then, of course, there's other entities. We have state agencies. We have the research community. And last but not least, we have all the water providers themselves who are collecting important data and doing the actual management of the water supply. All right, let's talk about the aquifer. And I always like to start with the location map. 
here we are. The red area is our aquifer system. It's setting inside the watersheds for Coeur d'Alene Lake, shown in green is the watershed for that lake. And for Lake Pend Oreille, the watershed shown in orange, this is from the Spokane Aquifer Atlas. Probably many of you have seen this graphic before. And of course, the blue outline is the Columbia River watershed. Um, this map shows, uh, this was produced by the USGS when they were building their model back in the mid 2000s just showing the aerial extent of the whole aquifer system. Um, they do identify a couple areas, Spirit Valley and Hoodoo Valley up to the north that are part of the aquifer system. They're also a little bit hydraulically separate from the aquifer system, but they are part of the aquifer system. Um, so we have this long aquifer extending from Lake Pend Oreille down into downtown Spokane and beyond a distance of what I think over 70, maybe 80 miles, quite a regionally extensive system. There have been different boundaries of the aquifer delineated over time. Um, back in the 70s, the aquifer got designated by EPA as a sole source aquifer, which was a formal recognition that it's the only water supply for this region. And so at that time, EPA delineated an area that you see in blue up there in that upper graphic Later on, the USGS and other researchers working in the area from kind of more a geologic perspective delineated the area in orange as the, the SVRP aquifer. And that's what most studies work with these days. Um, this is just a map from one of the many models that's been uh, developed over time. This was uh, one we got generated in 2012. And, um, showing that uh, colors are groundwater levels, highest groundwater levels in blue to the lowest groundwater levels in green and yellow. So groundwater is flowing generally north to south in Idaho and then east to west in Washington. So this aquifer was formed by catastrophic glacial flood deposits during the ice age. Many of you probably have heard about that story where what happened during the ice age was you had the ice sheets advancing south from Canada, kind of this part of the world, um, in the Purcell Trench in Idaho, uh, blocking the drainage of the Park Fork River, which allowed the lake to fill up. And then eventually the lake got so full that it actually lifted the ice dam and torrents of water came cascading down this, what is now the Spokane Aquifer System. Well, those catastrophic floods carried boulders, cobbles, Volkswagen-sized boulders, and just dropped them all right here. And what did that do? Well, it created one of the most permeable aquifer systems in the world. And what I'm showing you here are grids from two different models where the black model, black grid, I'm sorry, is a grid from kind of a regional scale USGS model that's mostly thinking about what's this resource on a you know, aquifer wide scale. The blue is a grid we developed for the purveyors at one point in time to help them think about how our individual wells um, behaving in the aquifer system. So we had to define that really fine grid. And we had to do it that way because they put the well so darn close together in this aquifer because it's so crazy permeable. And I was using a piece of software out of the Netherlands to do this. And at one point, I think I emailed the um, grid and the model back to the author and he emailed back saying, what the heck are you doing <laughs> with that grid design? And it's like, well, it's a whole different aquifer out here. It's not the kind we're used to. And certainly you can see that elsewhere. The previous slide was one of um, consolidated irrigation districts, well fields. This is city of Spokane over at the well electric well station. I'm sure some of you have been there and seen that. Large diameter caissons right next to each other in the ground, pumping huge amounts of water. And what I always thought was interesting, and Dan was telling me some of this history a while back, and it's documented elsewhere, was that back when they built up River Dam, and they were trying to put the footing for the dam on the south side of the river. 
they were trying to dewater the gravels there and they just had trouble doing it. Now they got the footing in and everything's fine. Well, that was mid 1980s. About 10 years later, the city started thinking, you know, we actually are having problems with water quality in our primary drinking water supply, which is the Spokane River. And someone remembered, oh, you know, there's another possible source. Remember that groundwater we couldn't dewater? Maybe we can use that. And so that was the genesis for the city's first well station, was that experience there. If you can't dewater it, go build a groundwater supply. Yeah. That's what they did. And that's what it looks like inside, you know, where you've got basically a 16 foot diameter opening in each location. And then the construction of that well, it's actually bell shaped. So down at the bottom of the well, it's a 40 foot, five foot diameter opening. That is not a conventional well that a driller drills these days, that's for sure. And that slide, I love going to conferences and other places where they don't know about the Spokane Aquifer. And I'll ask them, what do you think of when you think of a well house? And they just think of a little outbuilding. Not that. <laughs> That's park water. That has four or eight, eight, eight caissons in it with eight pumps that look like that. It's really a remarkable facility. Um, this is a view of the ground of, a, of a, one of the groundwater model simulations that kind of helps illustrate how crazy permeable this aquifer is. What you're looking at here, the different colors are one foot elevation changes in the elevation of the water table. And so highest on the right, lowest on the left. So we're looking at those two wells, Park Water and Well Electric, and then the Spokane River nearby. And What's kind of remarkable about this is in this model run, we had well electric pumping 39,000 GPM. That's about 56 MGD for reference. We had park water pumping 63,000 GPM. That's 90 MGD. And look at, we're only making little divots in the surface of the water table. In most aquifers, you'd be drawing down tens, maybe hundreds of feet at those kinds of pumping rates. But here it's just like barely a ripple in the surface of the water table. And you can even see that looking in section view at how localized this little divot is compared to the regional flow system. Um, well, that's modeling world. What about real data? Here's some data from Well Electric over a three year period. And what I want you to focus on are the green bars on the bottom showing when the wells are on versus when they're off. And then those two lines, the river stage and the groundwater level in the well. Now, a lot of hydrogeologists would look at this and say, oh, okay, when they turn the well off, groundwater levels went up. When they turn the well on, groundwater levels went down. Therefore, the pumping is causing the change in the groundwater level. Well, the data, yeah, that's what they show. But what they really show is that the river stage is what's driving the groundwater level, not so much the pumping. And that's, again, a reflection of how crazy permeable this aquifer is. Okay, so that was some background on the aquifer. Let's talk about groundwater models and what they do. I like to describe groundwater models as simulating two things. The plumbing, which is the subsurface geology, and what types of sediments or rock materials we have, how permeable they are, and then the water in the plumbing, which is where do we have water entering the aquifer, recharge occurring, at what rates, how does that vary on a monthly or seasonal or annual basis, where do we have groundwater pumping occurring to meet groundwater supply needs, um, and then where is groundwater discharging naturally in the system? You know, if we had no people here, and nobody was using water, well, there's still recharge occurring, which means groundwater has to exit the system somehow. So there's natural mechanisms for that, a lot of which involves the Spokane River and to a lesser extent, the Little Spokane. So plumbing and water in the plumbing, I'm gonna hit that theme a few times in this presentation. So 
great, that's a little bit of an intro to a groundwater model. How does a groundwater model help with water supply planning? Well, I think part of what I hope you get out of the presentation is that it's better to use a model than to wing it. And this is a picture of my son taking about a year after we were starting this project to develop the first model for the city of Spokane. I had a map that came off the CAD printer that I saw a problem with, and I was like, well, I'll take it home and let him play on it. And he started delineating capture zones. You know, he, <laughs> he, got, he, he figured out most of the groundwater was coming from the east. You know? I didn't even remember to tell him that. So yeah, he's one year old. He now uh, works for a chip manufacturer, manufacturing a lot of the servers that we run our models on, believe it or not. So pretty smart kid, smarter than I am. Um, but back to why we use a model, well, for planning purposes, one of the things we can do is we can think about how do we want to manage our use of groundwater. Um, we can change the pumping demands in the model. We can change the locations where we're pumping. We can change the volume of pumping at a given well. We can do that on a monthly or seasonal basis. And we can also think about things like what are climate for some reason the computer for example the, um, the computer it won't make up the um, dam are we seeing yeah. climate yeah. Fuck this. i don't know what's going on it is uh, i think we have somebody who's unmuted and we're getting a lot of interference in the room um, so, so anyway, what this graph is showing is just an example we've been looking at for the city of a number of different demand possibilities uh, 50 years out in time. So we can test all those in the model to see how it affects aquifer conditions and conditions in our wells. We can, oh, that's pumping. We can also change the natural hydrology of the system. We can start looking at things like you know, in black, here's what typically month by month our historic stream flows have been. And in the colors, here are a few families of different projections of how those stream flows could change in the future. Um, in this case, looking out towards the latter part of this decade in terms of changes in snowpack that might be climate driven and the timing of runoff in uh, all the various streams that help feed the watershed. So we can actually put these things in the groundwater model and see what it all means. And I'll show you some examples of that in a little bit. I do wanna spend a little bit of time going over the history of some of the groundwater models in the aquifer, because I think it's real illustrative of kind of the process of what models really should be about. They shouldn't be just static tools where you just develop it once and you say, we're done because it never works that way. Um, we always learn things. The models help us understand things. The data behind the models help us understand things. And that's really the way informed learning should be so we can do better management of groundwater. This was the very first model developed in the aquifer system. It was developed in the late 70s, early 80s by the USGS. It extended just slightly into Idaho. It was mostly a Washington model. It was pretty coarse in its spatial resolution. It rep represented the whole thickness of the aquifer as one layer. One of the interesting things about it was there was no standard software code for doing groundwater modeling back in those days. So the USGS actually wrote their own code to try to do this thing. Um, and you know they didn't do a bad job. It was a pretty good little yeah. starting point that people have built on since that time. In the mid 1990s, I started getting involved in work for initially the city of Spokane and then the Spokane Aquifer Joint Board to develop this model in the Washington portion of the system to support wellhead protection planning. And so you can see right here, this has a much finer grid, including around the city's wells than that earlier model that we were looking at. And so we were able to use that to our advantage to help develop capture zones to support the city's wellhead protection planning effort. Um, and a lot of data went behind this that I'll show you momentarily. Then the USGS came along in the mid 2000s 
And this work was real important because what they did was they developed the first model of the entire aquifer system, Idaho and Washington combined. And I'll go into some detail about what that model was about. And the other thing was they had some real standard software they had been working on and developing and testing in-house for about, oh, a little over a decade that was behind this tool and really is the it's a family of software tools and it's it's become the standard in the world for groundwater modeling now. So that was a big advancement as well. The city and the joint board built upon that tool a few years later to um, take their model, which is actually in a software out of the Netherlands and basically update um, its information with what had been learned by the uh, work that the USGS had done, but still giving us the ability to look at well field scales and not just kind of gross regional picture hydrogeology stuff. And then recently, we've been involved in a project starting for the city, which we just completed the work for them. We're working on it for the SAJB right now, and um, IWAC will be using it to build further in Idaho to basically take the best of all those models and the newest software, newest, I do mean newest software that's out there and build a new regional model. In this case, it actually doesn't have just one grid. It does have one grid that I like to call a parent grid. We've built it to have just a uniform spacing about 400 feet by 400 feet for every little grid cell which is about, each cell is about a third the size of what that old USGS model was. But what this model does is it allows us to go in and start building finer grids to look at things like what's going on along the Spokane River, what's going on around an individual well or a group of wells. There's a lot of flexibility with this tool and it's really revolutionized the groundwater modeling industry. And it's going to be a nice platform for IWAC to build a model that can be used by parties who want to make use of that model. Okay, now I'm gonna get into some details about not just modeling work, but field work that's really helped improve the models over the, air, over the years. I'm gonna start in the 1990s with a series of studies. Again, it was what was done to build the models that supported wellhead protection planning at that time. I'll then talk a fair amount about how the USGS built upon that. Again, those recent updates since the USGS work. And then I wanna give you a feel for what this next piece of work is, why there are going to be further updates of the model to really kind of get this to where there is a model that everybody will find useful. So let me start with the 1990 studies, and this is very field oriented. Um, before I get into those details, just kind of a couple of reminder graphics of here's where our aquifer is, here's groundwater levels, and importantly, here's how groundwater interacts with surface water. We have a losing reach of the river from Post Falls down to about roughly Barker Road, Sullivan Road, somewhere in that area. And then we have three reaches of the river I circled in red that are gaining reaches of the river where there are prolific amounts of groundwater flowing into the river, providing base flow to the river system. And so we think about those things quite a bit in all the modeling work that we do. Okay, this is where some of the fun begins. There was a big incremental leap in the understanding of the subsurface and our ability to monitor it after this first model was developed in the 70s by the USGS. And it started with myself and a geologist here in Spokane, a guy named Chuck Grunenfelder. I don't know if anybody knows that name, he's retired, yeah, you know. Um, we sat and stared at this map and thought, huh, look at this, there's a, flow system from east to west. And then down there, kind of at the west end, where those closely spaced contours are, what's going on? Is there a waterfall in the aquifer? We thought we were mo modeling groundwater, not a river. 
why would there be a waterfall there? And we were staring at that, having the natural hydrogeologic reaction of, huh, what's that all about? And as we looked at this more, we noticed that the USGS had reported that one of their calibration wells had a pretty big difference in terms of what they were simulating for the groundwater level versus what they were observing in the field. There was about a 30 foot error of the model vastly under simulating the groundwater flow direction on the east side of that five mile prairie bedrock. Well, with that map, you know, that map showing where the bedrock was present was based on basically surface geologic mapping and topography. You know, there wasn't a whole lot of subsurface information. And so we started thinking right away, there's got to be something going on there. And so we ran geophysical seismic surveys in all these locations shown in red to try to map what the shape of the bedrock underneath the aquifer looks like so we can understand how deep's the bedrock, how does it vary spatially, how does that affect aquifer thickness. Um, later for the SAJB, we also did one up to the Northwest shown in blue. And then once we got all that data, geologists did what geologists do, which is draw cross sections everywhere. And right away we could see that in that area where the, the old map had shown the waterfall, if you look in the upper left, the red line there, if you look at that cross section, you could see a very interesting picture here of where there's a lot of basalt bedrock. There's a lot of unsaturated material above it along that line and only a limited area where there's groundwater in a little notch in the basalt we now call Trinity Trough, named after a street out there, I think. Um, also, interestingly, in that section, the Spokane River is separated from that groundwater system by bedrock, at least in that little locality, they're not connected to each other. Um, this was a view just kind of looking along the axis of that trough, as well as below the trough and the stream of the trough. You see very flat water tables above and below the trough and the steep slope to the water table in the trough. Um, we also looked elsewhere. This is a section up to the Northwest where we could see that, yeah, indeed, we have a very thick aquifer passing east of that surface outcrop of basalt at Five Mile Prairie, happens to be bifurcated into an upper and lower section, separated by clay in the red, but it's thick. And so that's suggesting there actually is quite a bit of groundwater going to the north. So we went from this understanding based on surface information to this understanding based on the subsurface geophysics to where we now have an extensive bedrock feature that extends almost all the way to downtown Spokane, has a little notch in it, and now tells us a lot more about the plumbing. Remember I said that models have plumbing and there's water in the plumbing. Well, we understand the plumbing a lot better, at least structurally now because of that field work. Again, this is the early to mid 1990s that this is all happening. Well, at the same time, you know, we're preparing to build our first model for the city. And the other thing we recognized was not only do we need to better understand the plumbing, we also have some work to do on the water going into the plumbing. And so what we did was two things. We, well, one thing we did twice, which was to conduct synoptic measurements of groundwater levels and river stages all across the aquifer. Synoptic meaning at a given point in time, you're measuring water levels all throughout the system. And up until then, there wasn't really any time period where water level measurements had been collected everywhere at once. It was all scattered at different times of the year. So, you know, you could see one well with a summer water level measurement, another with a winter water level measurement, you know, pumping could be different, river stages could be different, it's totally apples and oranges. But here, by coordinating the data sets and doing it twice, fall 1994 and spring 1995, and thinking about the geology, 
we could start putting together actual maps of real time groundwater levels across the aquifer at any given point in time. And then doing that, not just for that time period, and, and notice what's going on down there in that little notch in the bedrock, you know, the water level contours are still tightly spaced. Like, you know, that early USGS study it showed it just, but it's in a much smaller area. And we have higher groundwater levels up to the north, like those old data sets had suggested. So that's the fall, this is the spring, very similar groundwater flow patterns. Okay, now we've got the water and the plumbing and I'm finally comfortable saying, okay, now let's start trying to build this model because it wasn't really worth doing it, frankly, until we had better field understanding of those things. And when we built the model and we started mapping out our model error, in other words, how different is the modeled water level versus the measured water level? And we contour that up spatially. You know, there's a 400 foot difference in elevation between the state line and the northwest edge where the groundwater is discharging. And over that 400 foot difference, I'm mapping out error on a five foot interval basis. So the blue, light blue and this dark green basically are saying we've got the groundwater levels within about five feet of reality. And look at how large an area is filled by the dark green and the light blue. And it happened not because we were manipulating math in the model, it's because we went and got all this meaningful field data and the calibration practically fell into place. We did that. It was really something to see. That became work that got, has been used to this day. The USGS incorporated that into their bi-state model and did a bunch of other things I'm gonna explain next. So here's that map again, showing the aerial extent of the aquifer. Um, this is from their model report. One of the first things they did was to think about what's going on up in Spirit Valley, Hoodoo Valley and the connection to the Northern Rathrum Prairie. And as so I was preparing this presentation, I went back and re-looked at all of that again because I couldn't remember all the details. And it was pretty interesting what they just showed and what they wrote about it. What they saw was that if they looked at the pair of wells I've circled in blue versus the pair of wells I've circled in red, I mean, they're not that far apart, but there's a hundred foot difference in groundwater elevations over that short a distance. And, you know, they were looking at a lot of water level data as they were thinking about that. And so what they concluded was that, okay, if there's that much difference, again, that's not a waterfall going on. It's probably a little like that five mile bedrock area, there's probably a constriction or something in the subsurface that's limiting how much water can move from the blue down to the red wells. And so these are just a lot of words, but basically what they said was, okay, all that water level data is actually giving us a clue about the subsurface and how it's behaving. We might have difficulty finding like if you gave the classic geologist an assignment of go find what that structure is or what that type of rock is, they might have a hard time finding it. But the water level data gives us a clue. And I don't know how many of you like to read mystery novels. I do. I'm big into Tony Hillerman and his daughter, Ann Hillerman, and all their novels about the American Southwest. Um, but in so many of those books, there's often something you've overlooked that is actually the clue to solving the crime. And in this case, the water level data is the clue to telling us what's really going on in the subsurface. And that was what the USGS concluded was going on up here. So they put a lot of thought into that. Then they compiled all the data for the wells that are present in the aquifer. The blue wells are withdrawing water from the SVRP. The brown wells, not many of them, but there's a few like in Ramsey Channel, Chilco Channel, they're actually drawing from basalt or clay materials. 
And then in a few cases, there's wells drilled into bedrock, um, particularly up near the Ramsey Channel. Um, they did the same for, spoke for the Washington portion of the aquifer, and then put all that into the model, developed cross sections all over the place. This is a classic example of a slide, don't worry about reading it, it's impossible <laughs> to read, go see the report. Big picture, lots of cross sections. And that all helps inform the model. They then develop contour maps that they programmed into the model of the elevation of the base. In other words, the top of the bedrock, the bottom of the SVRP aquifer, that goes in the model. They develop contours showing the thickness of the aquifer, that goes into the model. Notice the thickest areas are up there in North Idaho in what's called the West Main Channel. And in, in the brown, the olive color next to the brown is also pretty thick, and that's extending in the southern Rathburn Prairie. Little less thick as it crosses the state line, still fairly thick, it's 400 to 600 feet, um, but then it becomes more than 600 feet as you get further downstream into Washington. That all goes into the model. Then they start thinking about the hydraulic parameters that describe permeability of the aquifer, and they conceptualize these into sub areas of the model, areas where they're kind of like characteristic types of permeability and aquifer behavior, segregated sub area by sub area. Doesn't mean if you put two wells in, say, HK1 4, that they're going to be identically the same, but they're going to probably look somewhat similar and maybe a lot different than HK1 3, just as an example. They also then went to a lot of trouble to figure out how water is getting into the system, including from all of these tributary valleys surrounding the aquifer system. And so each of those black dots is a place where there is a sub watershed funneling water to the edge of the aquifer. And of course, you know, if you look at all the maps of the aquifer and around the region, you don't see streams or rivers over the aquifer, except for the Spokane River. That's the only one. Um, Everywhere else, those drainages are contributing water to the edge of the aquifer, and then it's just going right into the ground. And so the USGS figured out where those points are, um, how much water is getting to those points, and how that varies monthly and seasonally as well. That was part of their construction and calibration effort of that model, was figuring out the time variation of those terms. Um, they mapped out the locations of water purveyor wells, the dots, and the service areas for those wells. That's of about around the time period 2000 to 2002. Interesting how really there's not a lot of dots in the Idaho side, but you know there are some, of course, where the cities are. Um, they mapped out irrigated land parcels. Um, and these are the non-urban land parcels, so largely agricultural. Um, of course, there are some golf courses that have their own water supply wells. Those got mapped in here. The different colors are basically saying, on kind of a per acre basis, what percentage of that area had this type of irrigation going on that was not related to urban development. And so you can see quite a bit in Idaho, um, particularly in the central part of the kind of the southern Rathburn Prairie area, not as much in Washington. Um, sewer hookup densities. So that this was important because septic systems actually recharge groundwater. So where we're not sewered, we have to think about that contribution from a water budget standpoint. So what this map did was it looked at, okay, where we have sewers, we're not gonna have that return flow back to the aquifer. And this was another one of those density maps. Notice down here in the city of Spokane Valley, that area had, by this point in time, which was 2000, had gone from very low um, sewer density to 0.75, you know, almost completely sewered. And then of course, over in Idaho, you see areas where the cities are that are sewered. Um, few that are not, including 
just south of Hayden Lake. And this again was as of the year 2000. That all went into the model. Okay, so they put all these data into the model. And now what they're thinking of, about is how well is our model calibrated? And they started looking at the output from the model and many things they did to look at that. I'll just walk through a few. This one actually caught my eye as I was going through the report recently. Um, this was their representation of how much groundwater levels changed over about an 18 month period from a, a summer low condition in the fall of 2004 to a high spring condition. They picked it a year and a half later rather than a half year later. I don't know why, but they did. Um, and it's, it's an interesting map because look at the size of the triangle dictates how much change in water levels there is seasonally. That's what this map is doing. Well, look at where the variations are. The biggest variations, the biggest triangles in Idaho, they're along the very margins of the aquifer. That's reflecting variations in how much recharge is reaching the aquifer and then sinking in right on those outer margins of the aquifer. The middle of Rathman Prairie, those triangles are small. That's because the recharge is just far enough away and we don't have streams over the aquifer fluctuating how much they put into the aquifer on a seasonal basis. And even though there's seasonality in groundwater pumping, look at how small those triangles are. That's really fascinating. Again, I don't see that in many aquifer systems I work in, and I work in a lot. Look also in Washington, particularly from the state line down to um, that bedrock feature, the triangles are moderate to large in size. That's reflecting the fact that the Spokane River is driving how much water level change we see. Um, because it causes leakage into the aquifer from the state line down to Barker Road. And then there's some groundwater return back into the system. So I think that's a really interesting map. Um, another output from their model was they just basically said, okay, now given everything we know about the aquifer, all the data we put into the model and our simulation, here's our best estimate of a set of groundwater elevation contours at various points in time. This happened to be the fall season, low water table elevation of the aquifer. That's a nice map to help us kind of look at and think about, okay, when we put all these data sets together and our understanding of the aquifer, what is it telling us about the way the system behaves? They also mapped out the errors in their model. And these are errors in groundwater levels what the model's simulating versus what was measured in the field. And the only thing to take away from this is that the negative values shown in orange, the positive errors shown in green, they're actually kind of clustered spatially. There's not a random spatial distribution. There is a little bit, I mean, you see some, in some local areas, you get some of both but you get a lot of areas in Washington where it's orange triangles and in Rathburn Prairie, you get a lot of the green triangles. And this is one of the things in model geekery world that we have to spend a lot of time and sometimes can be very difficult to address is how do you get rid of spatial bias in how well a model is performing um, to replicate field data. So there, you just heard a bunch of geekery. Um, Besides looking at groundwater elevations, they spent a lot of time, and rightfully so, looking at um, the, how the model's simulating the exchanges of water between the Spokane River and the aquifer system, both in the losing reach and in these gaining reaches. And so those plots, the model result was the solid line. The dots are their best estimate of what the stream gauging and field measurements are telling them is the rate of gain or loss. And then of course the vertical bars are the error on their field estimate. And you can see there's some really big errors and uncertainties really is the word to think about around those field measurements. And they're just simply comparing 
How well does the model behave? Are we, are we simulating a losing reach where we should simulate a losing reach? Are we simulating a gaining reach where we should simulate a gaining reach? And generally the model's doing that. And then the question is just, are the rates of exchange reasonable? So us modelers think about that all the time. And this was just a similar plot for the Little Spokane River, um, which is gaining from Dartford down to the near Dartford gauge. And then lastly, and this is a whole topic unto itself, so I'm not going to go into it because we don't have time, but um, they subdivided the area conceptually and started providing written descriptions of what the groundwater budgets are, you know, which source of recharge is most important in each sub area. What are the recharge rates? Similar for discharge, similar for pumping. You can read all that in their report. I'm not going to get into it here. But that's a common use of a groundwater model is to understand the water budget, the water balance, not just aquifer wide, but in sub areas of interest. So a lot of great work, a lot of really solid foundational work in that USGS model. Um, afterwards, that wasn't the end of the story. There have been people who have used that model and there have been updates to that model that have occurred. And I'm going to talk about two of them we've been fortunate enough to be involved in. And they've looked at two aspects of the model in certain areas. One is the thickness of the aquifer um, at a few locations in Washington, mainly work that the city of Spokane has been conducting. And then also this parameter hydraulic conductivity that's a hydraulic property of the soils in the aquifer system, describes how permeable they are. Field work in Washington that's been very illuminative and has helped us understand, ironically, a little more about what those properties look, might look like in Idaho, which may seem odd, but I'll explain that in a minute. Start with the aquifer thickness. The city of Spokane has conducted drilling work and other work at three of its well stations, two on the south side of the margin of the aquifer, Ray Street in Havana, and a study still ongoing at um, Well Electric over on the north side. This is a contour map, shaded contour map of thickness of the aquifer as we understood it before those studies. So red and orange, those are the thickest parts of the aquifer, you know, 550 feet or thicker. Blues are the thinnest parts of the aquifer as we understood it. That understanding is based on a lot on kind of regional geophysics and what they call gravity surveys, as well as some of those other sections I showed you earlier. Um, ask me afterwards what a gravity survey is. Um, good information, but it doesn't tell you like what, what happens at a point right, like where we're going to drill a well. It's very regional, broad brush kind of stuff. Um, well drilling occurred at each of these sites and really changed our understanding of them. If you go back to this prior map, look down at Ray Street, our best estimate before the drilling occurred was that there might be around 300, 350 feet of SVRP at that location, Havana, Hard to know, it's kind of right on the edge of the aquifer. It might be 100 feet or less, it might be two or 300 feet. Well, electric, probably something less than 300 feet. Well, what the drilling has shown us is that Gray Street is a lot thinner than we thought, no more than 100 feet thick. Havana Street, aquifer thickness there is around 50 to 70 feet, if I remember correctly. And they've actually built a new well field there and just started operating it recently. Um, well electric, that's actually turning out to be a thicker sequence of aquifer than we thought. And it has different geologic materials than we thought. We've done quite a bit of exploratory drilling, two holes on the property itself, plus two on a piece of property up to the north. Um, this is just a picture of a sonic coring drill rig where they can take continuous core samples and we can study them to see what the materials are. Sometimes it doesn't work so easily in this aquifer where the cobbles and gravels are big. It has a hard time capturing them. But if you start seeing something other than cobbles and gravels, it'll pick it up. And in fact, 
we found something we didn't expect to see here. And this is where I, the modeler, are gonna keep saying the more field work we can do, the better. Um, we found a sand unit and it was surprising how little gravel content it had in it. It was very uniform sand and it was quite thick too. We only have about 125 feet of gravel at that borehole. I thought it was gonna be three, 400 feet thick. Nope, we've got a thick aquifer, but a lot of it's sand. And as we started doing more drilling and putting cross sections together, this section, which is BB prime on the well electric property itself, a second borehole confirmed that that wasn't just an isolated thing we were seeing in one exploratory hole. It actually has some spatial extent to it. And it's that thick, predominantly sand. It is a flood deposit origin, we think, but it's not the high energy gravels. Um, a similar section taken across the river on each side so showed the same thing. We were seeing the sand on each side of the aquifer, though on the north side of the river, it's not as thick. It's a little bit deeper in the system. We did see what we expected to see, which is bedrock is rising a little bit from south to north. And we know the bedrock is outcropping just north of that area. So that was not a surprise. But this really gave us a whole new picture of what kind of aquifer system we have, at least in that localized area. So that's thickness of the aquifer. The other term we care about is modelers, people who design wells, construct wells, do water planning, what's called hydraulic conductivity. So that's a, it's essentially a physical property of the aquifer. It is describing the permeability of the sediments. Um, so it's more than just a purely mathematical empirical coefficient, but it's not something you can easily you know, you can't go to a well or a soil sample and say, this is the hydraulic conductivity value and measure it directly. It's not like you can measure the thickness of the aquifer, you can measure that directly. This you can't, you have to infer it from different ways. Now, the thing we knew and we've known for a long time, everybody's known for a long time is that the aquifer is very permeable and has a high hydraulic conductivity, but trying to put numbers to it is a whole nother story. And as of 2007, we had a wide range of estimates of what that term is. And at the state line, spanning about a factor of three from 7,000 to 22,000 feet per day and elsewhere, um, a range of values depending on where you are in the aquifer system, spanning more than a factor of 10 from highest to lowest. So that was interesting. And we thought, okay, the USGS had a really nice graphic in their report that showed where we had some data that could help us try to pin those numbers down. And typically the way that those numbers get estimated is through controlled pumping tests where you pump a well for a certain period of time and you watch the drawdown response, not just in the pumping well, but in non-pumping observation and monitoring wells that you, know, you hope are close enough to the pumping well to be able to detect the drawdown occurring from the pumping well, which in most aquifers is easy to do, not easy in this aquifer because of how crazy permeable it is. Anyway, the USGS showed that as of the end of the 1990s, the only places where those kinds of controlled tests existed were basically in Washington. There was nothing in Idaho and there weren't many points in Washington either. And many of those points, there wasn't that great a non-pumping well network on which to make those estimates. And so what was interesting was if you looked at what our best estimates were in the time period when the city and SAJB were doing their wellhead protection programs, and then what the USGS came up with later, there was definitely kind of two families of values with the USGS values and those reddish blue boxes being notably higher than what most of the estimates were that we had at our hands in the 1990s. So this kind of begged the question of, well, okay, which is it and how are we gonna figure this out? 
And fortunately, the city of Spokane came to the rescue, whether they knew it or not. Um, and that's because they started looking at a possible new well station, which they have built called Havana Street. And they needed to know it was not a, it's on a piece of property that they did not initially own. And they were trying to make a decision about whether to purchase the property and develop a new well field. And as I'm sure the city folks know, they've looked at sites all over the city trying to figure out where could new well stations go and there just aren't that many. Um, so this one became a candidate and they asked us to take a look at it. They had a property owner willing to sell, but there was a very short timeline to make that decision. The parcel size was not really all that large. And, you know, they, like we, were kind of concerned, oh boy, is this, does this make sense or not? Because it's right on the edge of the aquifer. We don't know how much thickness we're working with and whether there's enough there to build a well field. And sometimes when you're on the edge of an aquifer, you know, think about river mechanics or mechanics of a, of a catastrophic flood deposit. All the big stuff's going to drop in the deepest part of the you know, river channel, right? And the floodplains are gonna have all the fines in it. You know, we didn't know if there was gonna be much permeability to that aquifer system in that area, let alone enough thickness. So we did a quick hydrogeologic study, got drill rigs out there, collected core samples, looked at them visually, ran them through SIF tests in geophysical labs, developed grain size curves, used those to develop um, the design for a test well at the site. Um, just looking down the screen of the test well that we installed, the slot size of the screen is often dictated by what those soil samples look like. So we developed, designed the well, put the well in. There's a picture of the screen going in in the lower left corner, lower right corner. Once the well was in, we hooked up a bunch of piping to the nearest city storm system we could find and then made sure working with city staff we could actually discharge the water and not cause issues with the stormwater permits and then we started testing the well we did 60 minute tests at a number of different pumping rates ranging from 810 to 1850 gallons per minute basically those rates were um, constrained more by the size of the well we picked more than the aquifer, as it turned out. We probably could have pumped a lot more with a larger well. Um, then we picked a pumping rate and ran a test for five days, monitored the water levels in red in the pumping well, the orange, green, and blue were water levels and some monitoring wells that were already very close by. Thank you, Spokane County. Um, and we had transducers in them tracking the water level fluctuations like every minute or so. We also tracked the river stage records being reported at the Spokane Gauge downtown. And we monitored both before the test as well as for a long time afterwards watching the water level recovery. Subtracted out background trends, just regional trends in the aquifer system. And then we're able to draw plots showing the change in the groundwater level, probably should have flipped it the other way so it's clear it's drawdown, but oh well. Um, you get the idea. Drawdowns, look at that. We pumped 1,600 gallons a minute. The test well had 0.7 feet of drawdown after five days. That's 1,600 GPM. The three monitoring wells, which were like 50 feet away, maybe 100, 0.17 to 0.3 after five days, very permeable. So we could put all that into a bunch of different equations and analytical calculation methods to back into that hydraulic conductivity term. And what did we get? We got a range of estimates between 12,700 and 18,300 feet per day I like to describe it as nominally 15,000 feet per day. And this is in an area where the USGS was thinking it's probably approaching 9,500 feet per day. And the old models that we had before we had this kind of data even thought it was a third of that. 
So clearly what this test was telling us was that in this locality, at least, things are pretty permeable and maybe more so than we thought. And so we've taken that information, again, thank you, City of Spokane, you didn't know you were doing this, but you did. And we've put it all into the model and kind of said, okay, if we now go take that earlier USGS representation and our best and newest software, which we're now using here, this was in 2023, and look at this whole model again and try to replicate the regional water table picture that the USGS has given us. This is the range of values we back into. There are a lot more in the general order of magnitude of what the USGS came up with. They're not exact, but they're close. And, and, and so what that one field test did was it said, okay, you've got big uncertainty about is the parameter sitting in this kind of lowish range or in this really highish range. And that one test said, it's a lot closer to that highish range. And it really, really, to me, it was a big incremental thing in improving our understanding of the aquifer system. Okay. Thanks for hanging with me in there, through all of this. We're getting somewhat towards the end. I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about the work IWAC wants to do and why further model updates are needed. As you can see, over time, steps along the way, we've built better models, we've learned things in the field that inform the models. Well, there are some things to do to basically take that bi-state model and modernize it. One of the things to do is to give it much better spatial resolution than it had. It, as you saw from some of the early slides, if you have a well field with multiple wells, the grid sizes were way too coarse for being able to ask yourself questions about how each well is performing and the drawdown interference between wells and you know what's happening with water levels in each well. And you know that also limits the ability to do other things like delineate capture zones for a wellhead protection program. So that's a fairly easy thing to do. We've already done a lot of work in this area to um, actually already take this model and put a much more refined grid into it. Um, but another reason to update the model was that it kind of had non-ideal layering in it. And what I mean by that is that in most of the aquifer, they use just one layer to represent the whole darn thickness of the aquifer. And the only place they didn't do it was up here in this area called Hilliard Trough, where the geologists had already identified that there's an upper aquifer, a clay, and then a lower aquifer. Well, the problem with that is that's not really the way the system behaves or is structured. If you look at most wells and cross sections, they don't penetrate the water table very far. Why? Because why pay a driller more if you got this crazy productive aquifer? Nobody's gonna do that. Um, the only deep holes are actually those cathodic protection holes. Um, they're not pumping wells. And the geologic logs on them, you know, they're decent, but they're not quite as detailed as what you might get as um, for a water well. And so that actually matters for water planning. Um, we have taken the models and subdivided them into eight layers because we've been trying to solve problems for water purveyors, particularly the city, to think about, particularly at Well Electric, whether they ought to think about a deep well field in that sand unit I was showing earlier. This plot shows a model result right after we discovered that sand unit and started doing some hypothesis testing with the model. The yellow lines are showing if you pump the caisson wells in the shallow layer, layer one, here's where the water wants to come from. If you design a series of wells down in what was the fourth through seventh layers of the model, here's where the water wants to come from, two totally different directions. You can't come up with that if you only have one layer in your model. It's never going to produce that result. And so, you, you know, that matters. Just another view of cross-section, you can see that you, know, you get two very different interpretations of where the water is coming from. And that's obviously important when you're thinking about you know, the quality of the water, what's in connection with the river close by versus farther away. 
which is one of the things the city was thinking a lot about at this well station. So having better layering is something important to do with the model. Um, the other thing was the USGS, and they've done this in a number of basins, particularly back in that era. I don't know if they do it as much anymore, but they would tend to lump together pumping and all the return flows from pumping. So if you looked at a well in the model and you say, oh, I think it's pumping 2000 GPM. Well, it might actually be pumping 2200 or 2300, but they called it 2000 because they were subtracting out the return percolation from irrigation water uses from that well. And then also if that well contributes to septic systems, they're subtracting out that return flow as well. Well, that makes it hard to go and take a model and say, I wanna vary the pumping to test a different water management scheme. So we've actually already done some work to try to break apart those terms. It wasn't easy, it was very frustrating actually. And our current model, gets us something closer back to the aquifer wide pumping. That's primarily in Washington, and there's more work to do on this front in Idaho. Reason number four is the fact that the model was calibrated through 2005. Well, that's almost 20 years ago, and a lot has changed since then. Tons of growth here in Idaho. So different wells, probably more wells, retirement of ag lands, conversion to urban lands, that sort of thing, that should get all updated in the model. That's an important thing to do. And of course, you know, whatever the year to year and monthly variations and the natural hydrology were, are not gonna be the same before 2005 as what they were since then. So we wanna cap capture those changes as well. And then lastly, it's my belief that I think what IWAC would want out of this is kind of a common modeling platform for everybody to work from. And I think that's going to be a major goal of the project. And, and this new software really helps get us there because you can create this parent grid and then people can go and embed child grids wherever they want to look at an issue of interest. And I'll just give you an example of how that played out in a basin I do a lot of work in down in uh, Southern California, just north of LA. This is the Santa Clarita Valley where maybe some of you know where Magic Mountain is. It's that basin down there. Um, about six, seven years ago, we've done modeling for them since about the year 2000. And we went through a similar process over the years of expanding models, upgrading the software over time, that sort of thing. And about six, seven years ago, we did the kind of model effort for them that IWAC wants to do right now, where we basically built a parent grid and the first, what I call sub-regional grid, the thing called level two. And what that's been about is looking at groundwater sustainability, looking at groundwater surface water interactions, that sort of thing. Well, a few years later, they came to us and said, you know, we got a PFAS problem in our aquifer system and we wanna build a centralized treatment plant with about four production wells. Can we cram them into a parcel of land over here and pump them at those rates and be able to actually operate it? Or is there gonna to be too much drawdown interference? So we created this level three grid here to examine that problem. And that's kind of the vision I have for what this IWAC model could be is that people could use it to look at, you know, um, any issue they want to for their individual water system, as well as looking at regional water management at the same time. So with that, I'm gonna finish off by talking a little bit about some of the ways that models have been used for these kinds of planning efforts. Just first acknowledging to City of Spokane that really developed the first model that was useful for a water purveyor for their water planning. And that was initially with wellhead protection in mind. That was what drove that work. Um, after the bi-state model was created, um, they went and expanded the model into Idaho, again, to give them that tool that helps water purveyors, but also covers the whole aquifer system. And around that time, they established their integrated capital management group, which works together with the water department 
on resiliency and capital planning projects, and among other things, has funded some pretty detailed studies of the conditions of their infrastructure and how that infrastructure might be affected by things like, you know, needing to pump more groundwater to meet, you know, future water demands and things like possible changes in climate, how that affects the aquifer system. Besides the city, SAJB, I think many of you know that group, cities, water districts, water and power companies, irrigation districts, and some large businesses, all relying on the SVRP for their water supply, formed in 1995, really with the goal primarily to implement wellhead protection and groundwater quality protection, but they have funded some water resource studies. And then of course, IWAC founded roughly 10 years ago or so, um, 19 members, all water purveyors, five advisory members. And you know their mission being to develop management strategies protective of the whole aquifer, facilitate regional dialogues and technical studies. And you know, thinking about work they've done to date, they've really had so far a special focus on water use efficiency um, and education, and of course, notably developing standards for irrigation and landscape design. And they wanna take this next step now with, you know, let's, let's have this groundwater model that's gonna be useful to everybody. So I'm gonna go on a little bit of a thing about some example projects that have used field studies and models together to understand water management. I'm gonna have to go through this really fast. Um, SAJB did a study about 10 years ago where they were looking at this curve of August stream flows from 1900 to about 2010 that come out of a ecology study. And SAJB was scratching its head going, huh, why are the stream flows in the summer still decreasing over time when water use efficiency has improved? Um, there's a lot less agricultural irrigation with all of its leaky canals and all this other stuff pulling water out of the river. And why at the same time is that happening when the USGS, not in the bi-state model, but in a separate study had come out saying that the inflows to Coeur d'Alene Lake and the Spokane River were not showing any signs that they too were decreasing like this plot was showing. This is a plot down town at the Spokane gauge. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that. And at the SAGB was scratching its head going, huh, okay, what does that mean too? Now that ecology is gone and put an in-stream flow standard into place down at the Spokane gauge. And if you think about that standard on the left, it's plotted in green against you know, some of the flows in the driest years, which are plotted in red. You know, one thing we see right away is, oh boy, in some of those worst years, we can see you know, flows that are a lot lower than that in-stream flow standard downtown. You know, why, how are we gonna deal with that? How's the community gonna deal with that? Um, and given this possible fact that we're seeing lower flows in the river as well, so we embarked on a detailed study. I don't have any time to get into. It was multiple phases. The first two phases were a combination of digging through historical data, running the groundwater model, and basically asking ourselves those three questions right there, which is, is groundwater pumping drying up the river? As some people in the community were asking. The answer turned out to be no. Has groundwater pumping in increased volumes of pumping, are they continuing to increase? Well, if you go back and look at the whole historical record, the answer is no. Um, and then what's happening in the aquifer, you know, where we have wells with long-term records or records over the last few decades, are we seeing problems like say in the Central Valley of California or other parts of the world? where groundwater levels are declining pretty steadily over long time periods? And the answer is no, we're not seeing that here at all in this aquifer. Aquifer looks pretty healthy actually. And so we looked at all that and we thought, why are river flows going down when the aquifer looks healthy? And the only thing we could think of was there must be something going on in the watershed upstream. 
And so we looked at Snowtel data, stepped out of the model world because we tried to think about it all with the model and went back to basics. Let's go look at some data. Let's look at Snowtel data, particularly at kind of the mid elevations, not the very crest of the mountain range, but also not in the lowest areas. And that sunset station showed us some real interesting data about the amount of water in the snow, what we call the snow water equivalent. When we lumped together pre-2000 data and post-1999 data and started plotting the number of occurrences on the vertical axis and how much water is in the snow on the horizontal axis and started comparing those groups, we could see some differences between those two groups. In December, a lot less snow in the yellow bars post-1999 versus the blue bars pre-2000. Well, that's early in the season. Maybe it's not so different. Let's look at that as we get more into other months of the year. There's January. Hmm, still some differences. Here's February. Looks kind of the same. I mean, the volumes are going up. We're seeing more and more snow but the earlier time period isn't looking the same as the more recent time period. Here's March, uh, very similar pattern. And here's April. This course is a big one because water managers think about what's the snowpack on April 1? And what does that tell us about the water year that's coming up, particularly the summer conditions? And you can still see some differences here, basically a leftward shift over time um, in all of these months, and certainly here in May, which is a month that, you know, tends to have more variability in how much snowpack there is. So a little harder to make out the differences, except you can see on the left, the number of occurrences of zero snowpack in May is a lot more in that post-1999 data, almost 90 occurrences over 15, 16 years compared to the pre-2000 data where it never exceeded 50 occurrences. And so putting that together with what we were seeing at the Spokane gauge and tracking over time from 1982 through 2015, if we compare that April snowpack in yellow to the August flow downtown Spokane in green, we could see similar trends. Um, in, in that the April snowpack seems to be dictating what we're seeing in August. And it makes sense if you think about it physically, because a watershed is a complex dynamic system with a lot of things going on in it. You know, there's infiltration into the bedrock, the slow release of water from bedrock back into the river during the summer months. Um, plant canopies are taking up water and all that kind of thing. And so those complex watershed processes are what convert the April snowpack into an August stream flow and take some time to do that. Um, so a few years later, the city of Spokane came to us and said, well, that's interesting. What does that mean for our wells? And we started doing a study to look at that question, which was, how can that change the aquifer? How can that change groundwater levels in the wells? Plus, how does our increase in growth projections 50 years out in time potentially change things? And I won't go through all this right now, but it was basically groundwater modeling plus conditions of the infrastructure. And we looked at this at every well station, this being one of the well stations, Nevada. And we asked ourselves, okay, with all the modeling and all the projections, what is it suggesting about what could happen in the latter third of the century and in August, um, our lowest water level month, our lowest month of stream flows in the river? How might these things look in the future? And we looked at water levels for three different levels of demand. We plotted the change compared to historical conditions. And so the black line means zero change. Um, if you're above the black line, water levels should be higher than what they were historically. If you're below, they're going to be lower than what they were historically. Well, nothing was above the line. And the amount of change according to different levels of demand 
and different projections about the future, which is why you see multiple bars for any given color. Those are different climate projections told us, wow, there's a family of possibilities here towards 50 years from now, 60 years from now, 70 years from now. Water levels might be, particularly if you focused on the 2072, 50 year level of demand, anywhere from maybe four feet lower to in the worst case, 11 feet lower. Okay, that's interesting. Does that matter? Well, let's look at the construction of the well. So here's a schematic profile. I actually did this in Excel. I was very proud of myself. <laughs> um, showing the historical low water level, showing the bottom of the caisson well, and it's an 18 foot diameter, I think, caisson well. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so it's big, which means it has four pumps in it, and two are centrifugal, two are submersible. They're at different depths where those intakes are and they have different submergence requirements for proper operation. Well, here's our historical low water column, the blue. That's good. We've got submergence of all four pumps. That's pretty operationally effective. That's historically always been the case. It's one little problem though. If we look at that 50 year demand projection and the possible climates that could happen, 50 years from now, according to some of the scientific studies, they suggest that water levels are gonna fall somewhere in that range for the red bars that you see, in which case, if that were to come to pass, all four of those pumps suddenly don't have enough operating head on them. And of course, if it's the low end, the worst case, you, know, you also have two pumps that are sitting there high and dry. So that was that Nevada well station. We also, sorry, we also looked at well electric over there near the river, which is a little different because it has two large caissons. They're at different depths. But again, what we saw was the same kind of thing, which is that um, the, uh, I think something happened to this graphic. Sorry about that. But basically we have two pumps that I think yeah, the, the required submergence is already a little sketchy at one of those pumps, but it's close. It's gonna operate, same with the one on the right, but then there's two on the left where historically it's been fine, but even those two are gonna struggle and certainly two are not gonna be feasible at all going forward over time at that well station either. Um, we've also been doing assessments of other aspects of vulnerability and resiliency planning for the city. This one, which um, we're near wrapping up, is actually looking at contamination threats. And in particular, what would happen at city well stations if there was to be a release of a petroleum product from the regional Yellowstone oil pipeline. And what we've done here is we've used the model to trace particles, imaginary particles that we placed all along the black, which is the black is where the pipeline is present in different branches of the pipeline. We've kind of traced them forward in time to see where do they go. And you can see some of them have the possibility of being picked up by certain wells like well electric and park water in particular. There's also some risk to Havana and Ray Street. And we've been thinking about that with respect to long-term resiliency because as highlighted in orange, park water and well electric are their two largest production sources. They feed multiple pressure zones in the distribution system. They are key, 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 key wells for providing a water, a reliable water supply to the city. And so they're critical. And if any well goes down, they become even more critical. And if one of them goes down, things become critical too. We've used the model to actually estimate what could the travel time be to any of those wells from a release from the pipeline. And it's not years and years and years, it's months. And in fact, in Parkwater's case, there's one segment of the pipeline running pretty close by where if that segment were to have a failure, probably show up in one to two days. So the city is thinking about this in terms of its resiliency planning as well. So I just wanted to put this up there because it's not just about groundwater resource stuff. It's not just about pumping. It's about everything that goes into thinking about resiliency of an aquifer system. 
And with that, I'm gonna close by saying again, I as a groundwater modeler feel the more information you can get and the more data you can do, the city is back out there doing more investigatory drilling at Well Electric to help inform its decision-making about in particular, possibly installing deep wells someday as one way to provide a more reliable water supply that is not influenced by high river flows, which they have to shut the well down when the river flows get high because you're too close to surface water and the water quality rules around that. And then the contamination threat from that pipeline. Those are two big reasons for the city to look hard at building a deep well field and to be able to use that well field reliably under just about any condition they can think of. So I did a lot of talking. Thank you for bearing with me. And like I said, I'll be around uh, if you have any questions. I don't know if we have time for some quick questions before the next speaker. Um, well, we're gonna take a, take a quick, well, we got a couple minutes, yeah. A couple okay. minutes for some uh, questions, if anybody online or um, anyone in the room has a question or John will be here, you can catch him during the break, <laughs> either way. Okay. Oh, here we go. Yeah. You talked very much about the lakes on the Idaho side. How important do you feel those are to just looking at the model? Well, they are important contributors um, from the water budget perspective. And the lakes are really interesting because, you know, again, there's no streams coming out of the lakes. So what's happening with those is, you know, they have they essentially butt up against the margin of the aquifer. So there's just this kind of continual bleeding of water out of the lake, through the lake bed into the aquifer system. And I kind of view the lakes and the lake beds as a little bit of a, a buffer, so to speak. You know, you can have a lot of climate variation and seasonally, you know, evaporation, of course, very strongly in a seasonal sense and the way the lake is operated at, you know, Coeur d'Alene or up at Pend Oreille, um, that, you know, those, those all matter too. But with all these variations that go on on the surface, um, the fact that essentially the leakage is out the sides and probably a little bit of the bottom of the lake, um, you know, is, is probably just feeding a fairly constant amount of water into the lake, into the aquifer system. And the USGS had done a lot of work to, to look at what that looks like and had provided estimates that showed it was important. Yeah. How much looking into the pros and cons of dams have you guys done? As far as retaining water that might force more into the aquifer, obviously it's affecting flows in the river. Yeah, we haven't done a lot of that here. Um, up at Coeur d'Alene, up at Lake Coeur d'Alene, you know, it's a little bit, the dams are all sitting on bedrock up there and the, the river's sitting on bedrock. It's not really leaking a lot into the aquifer until it starts moving beyond the, um, the dam. There's probably a little bit, you know, where the glacial sediments kind of came right up to the edge of the river above the dam, there's probably a little bit of leakage there. But I think the way that dams operated is probably more significant with respect to how much water is coming down the river um, below Post Falls. Um, uh, I mean, it, it, it'll have some influence on the groundwater system too. There is, there is an issue, you know, issues not the word but there's a relationship there probably but um yeah, that's my best answer if you think to your question Suzanne uh, can you speak to I I've heard that the 2007 model over the Raptor Prairie aquifer extent uh calculated aquifer depths based on pump depths mm. is that is that something that you could clarify and, and if that is true, will do you anticipate it's going to have some significant impacts on on a, a model update? We'll want to look at that. Um, the The report that they wrote says that they were using, um, you know, geologic studies to map out the basement bedrock. 
but I, I had wondered a little bit about some of the thickness up there in that Chilco Channel area and Ramsey Channel. You know how much how much control really was there up there, and I don't know if that's the area you're thinking about. Okay, yeah, well, it probably deserves a closer look if if there's questions about it. Yeah, was there another question? Oh, Lauren. I want to clarify on, on that uh, quarter lane way. Um, you believe because it's in a uh, bedrock yeah. that the lake itself is not a major contributor to the aquifer, other than feeding the river all summer long. Yeah, the the and it's interesting. I'm, thanks for asking that question because the USGS had looked at this, and there have been some other studies. There is some seepage from Coeur d'Alene Lake itself to the aquifer, but it's actually not one of the biggest contributors compared, say, to Ponderay Lake, um, uh, they think, for flow. There's there's some evidence from groundwater levels in uh, Coeur d'Alene at the various wells and comparing it with lake levels that there may not be a quite as strong a connection there between the lake bed and the aquifer system uh, compared to, say, what's happening at Ponderay Lake or, you know, parts of the Spokane River. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know that when I first started working up here, I would have thought, oh, major source of water, you know, maybe the biggest one. And the study seemed to be suggesting, yeah, it's a source, but not one of the biggest ones. Yeah. 